for this third uh, edition of our new live conversation series um, from Ask Nature Hive. We're really excited to have uh, guests returning, people who have been with us now for all three of these, uh, new members of the Hive, guests that are arrived, and we're really happy to have our uh, featured speakers, Amanda and Erin. Um, I want to let everyone know that this is being recorded, and we'll be able to uh, add the replay to YouTube later today, so that'll be available for you to see uh, you know, in perpetuity. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, if you'd like to be on screen, you can be on screen. If you'd like to have yourself off screen the whole time, feel free to do that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. This is a conversation. So we'll start with a kind of a presentation from Amanda and Aaron, and then we'll open it up for conversation. There's lots of ways that you can engage. You can see the slide here. There's an open chat for just talking to people, but for questions that you have for the speakers, there's a separate Q&A button that you can hit. If you go in and just type in your questions, you can add them there. You can like and comment to other people's questions in there as well. And our staff will also be looking at that and we'll reach out to you and maybe uh, go back and forth and see if you would like to come on screen to ask your question in the second half of this event where, where we uh, really open it up. So that's really fun. We like that because everybody likes to see who they're talking to and, and have fun. If you would prefer not to be on screen, you can uh, do that as well. You can even submit your questions anonymously if you have some uh, questions or you just wanna do it that way. So uh, watch in the chat is where our staff will reach out to you after you've submitted questions to, to coordinate anything like that. Okay, so uh, thanks again. We're really excited for today's event. Uh, Amanda is our CEO. Uh, as you know, Amanda Sturgeon and has a long and glorious uh, history of this kind of work um, in the built environment. Aaron Ravala does as well and is a longtime uh, member and supporter and engager with biomimicry and the Institute and serves on our board and uh, is really a great voice for a lot of things that we're uh, really excited to bring into this conversation today. So um, without further ado, I think I'll hand it over. And uh, Amanda, Aaron, welcome. Welcome to everyone that's here. And uh, let's get started with biomimicry, biophilia, and the built environment. Hi, just had some troubles uh, unmuting myself there. Here we go. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Amanda, as Andrew said. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so excited for the conversation today just because Aaron and I have known each other for a while now, and we've had these conversations in private in all kinds of locations, from beachside to walks to, um, you know, in more formal uh, sort of work settings. And, um, you know, I always like thoroughly enjoy my conversations with Erin and, and how we kind of think about this intersection of biophilia, biomimicry and built environment. So, I'm just so excited to share it with all of you um, so that hopefully you find it as fascinating as we do because we're both really passionate about it. Um, so I'm going to start off just talking about biophilic design um, and what it is uh, from a big sort of picture perspective um, and dig in a little bit uh, into what it is. And I'll, I'll cross in a, a little bit into the intersections with biomimicry, but Erin's going to go into, into more of that um, as she follows me. So uh, biophilia, the hypothesis is that there's a, this instinctive bond between human beings and other living systems. It's been mapped in our brains for thousands of years, and I think this isn't something new to those that follow and love biomimicry. Um, and I think this is a key a key component because what we're really trying to look at with biophilia and biophilic design is how we reestablish uh, that connection. So from a biomimicry uh, kind of lens, it's very much about the reconnect component um, that we see um, uh, in biomimicry as well. So I think I'll, I'll bring in a few of those themes around this reconnect. And there's been a lot written about biophilic design. There's a lot of resources about biophilic design. Um, and uh, really started with uh, Stephen Kellett, who has passed now, who was a Yale professor, um, taking sort of or being inspired by and collaborating with the work of E.O. Wilson. 
Um, and then looking at how it kind of this connection between people and nature could apply to the buildings and spaces that we make for ourselves. Um, so uh, there's quite a bit that's sort of formulated, if you like, a resurgence. And I would say a resurgence because I don't think our connection to nature in the built environment is anything new. I think it's just that a um, hundred or so years ago, we seemed to lose that connection in what we were starting to build. Um, but certainly we can look back to indigenous cultures and structures and see this connection playing out in our built environment and spaces for thousands of years. So um, I like to frame biophilic design in this way. So what if we could experience the same physical, psychological and emotional benefits of moving through an urban landscape or occupying a building? that we experience walking through a forest. So I think sometimes biophilic design, we kind of assume it's about sort of bringing maybe patterns or colors or green walls into a space. It's actually more about um, the psychological, emotional benefits we have through nature. And that's where I also feel like um, it's very closely connected with biomimicry because we're not bringing the forest literally into the building. We're actually mimicking the qualities of that space that we experience in a forest. The mixed uh, soundscape, the changing layers of light and color, the patterns that bring us a deep sense of peace and restoration when we're immersed in it. Um, and I think it's uh, essentially at its heart about um, understanding what those qualities are in nature and mimicking those within the building uh, or built environment space. So, um, you know, we have a strong connection to nature. I think all of us would know that. Um, it's very strong when we're kids, we explore, we love nature, we're fascinated by it. And then somehow when we grow up, we tend to create horrible spaces that we spend all of our time in. Um, there's no sense of place to this kind of space. There's no delight. There's no connection to nature. There's not a, a green leaf in sight. Um, and unfortunately, that is that is the kinds of spaces that we mostly uh, live and work in when we, especially when we look globally. Um, and we do spend as a culture 90% of our time indoors. So as much as um, those of us that are privileged enough to be able to go to wilderness and spend time in nature and be immersed in it. The reality is, is that many, many people do not have that opportunity. And this is the reality or worse of where they spend their days. Um, so I think biophilic design also has the ability to um, uh, have a sort of a social benefit lens in terms of thinking about people's well-being and health. And uh, there's been quite a lot written and studied around that and the impacts of it. Somehow, and I, I still don't know how, we, we started building buildings where people have no access to daylight um, or any ventilation and have no idea what, whether it's raining, sunny, windy, there's a bird outside or not. And, um, and these spaces, unfortunately, are, are more and more ubiquitous and keep getting built. Um, I just wanted to mention that I did do a book. Um, it's um, a case study book, essentially, around biophilic buildings. And it has 14, um, mostly kind of North American, but there are some international examples as well, um, of buildings looking at how uh, they had integrated biophilic strategies and looking at sort of the patterns across them. And um, this is just a slide showing all of those projects. Uh, so they went, we didn't have, um, I didn't have residential buildings in here, but um, from academic institutions to office buildings to public buildings um, and uh, yeah, and sort of environmental education, sort of visitor center spaces. Um, and in that book, I used a framework by Stephen Keller, who I mentioned earlier. And this was a framework that he created with uh, lots of input. Um, I had the chance before, before, um, before he passed to talk to him about these elements and attributes quite extensively. Uh, Judy Heerwagen, um, out of Seattle, Martin Mador, many others were part of kind of bringing in some thinking around this. So this was a this was an attempt um, really to kind of capture what are all the ways that we can bring nature into a built environment space. Um, how do we both bring it in literally, 
uh, and do the reconnect piece where the essence of those senses that you get in nature are replicated in the built environment space. Um, there are other versions of this that simplify it. I'll show one in a little bit. 14 patterns from Terrapin Green, who have also done some incredible work uh, around biophilic design. Um, but I'm just going to walk through a little bit of this because you'll see starting from the left with environmental features. This is probably what you think of if you think of biophilic design, which is, oh, it's about bringing in green walls and green roofs and, um, you know, maybe having a water feature. Um, and I would say in here, too, uh, what you'll see is it's about natural materials, having natural ventilation, um, air being connected to habitats and ecosystems or potentially restoring those habitats and ecosystems as part of the project. Um, so most people think of these environmental features ca category as what biophilic design is. And, and what I love is that, you know, to the right of that is this whole palette as a, as a former architect designer of things that you can kind of grab hold of and um, actually really use as you're conceiving of a built environment space. Um, and so you'll see with natural shapes and forms, this is also feeling quite biomimetic and you'll see biomimicry as a specific category in Kellett's um, uh, list here. I, if I was to redo this list, I would kind of shift this and I think Aaron will probably touch into this a little bit in terms of where we think biomimicry and buildings um, and biophilic design actually intersect quite a bit more robustly. But um, but you'll see it's about bringing motifs in, those types of forms you might have in the building using natural shapes, for example. Natural patterns and processes is then looking at that sort of sensory um, sort of feeling of peace and, uh, you know, connection that you get when you're walking through that forest I showed at the beginning. Um, so you're getting a sensory variability. There's a richness of the information available. You're getting kind of contrast and dynamic sort of balance and tension between uh, species and ecosystems. You're getting exposed to fractals um, and sort of transitional spaces and a change in those spaces. Those are all things that we can use as a design palette, essentially. Um, then light and space. I think um, those that are uh, working in designing buildings can use light as a palette, essentially. So it's not just about let's do a lot of, you know, natural light, but it's also when we look in nature, we see light used um, in all kinds of different ways, from reflections to shadows to light pools. Um, and again, this is ways that we can create this sense of uh, connection to, to space where we can track um, the movement of the sun over the day, we can track the seasons while we're in spaces. Um, and then place-based relationships is really about us reconnecting to the specific place. I think it's pretty impossible to do a good biophilic design project if it is not um, deeply rooted in and connected to the culture um, and the ecology of the place. And then lastly, you'll see these sorts of really experiential uh, components of biophilic design, which are about how we create a sense of prospect, safety, um, and refuge, prospect and refuge, so the safety and also the ability to see what's coming ahead of you, how we design spaces to be able to have curiosity, excitement, exploration, discovery, all those kinds of things that we see um, in the natural world. And um, I would say in my studies of the case studies, this is where I see the least amount of mastery. <laughs> um, I think uh, there's a huge opportunity for uh, understanding kind of those kinds of feelings and senses you get in the natural world and thinking about how our built environment spaces can create those uh, types of experiences. Too often what we see is very beige, blank, uni unified lighting, um, you know, the whir of a sort of air conditioner. It's, it's not very sensory rich, the interior spaces that we create for ourselves, especially when you start to look at the hotel and um, commercial uh, sort of sectors, but even educational. Um, in the 1970s, there was a big push to make schools as sterile and boring as possible so there wasn't a distraction to learning. Um, fortunately, there have been studies that show that actually that really uh, held back learning 
and uh, creativity and uh, excitement and innovation. Uh, this is Terrapins, uh, 14 patterns. You'll see it's kind of, you know, from the sort of larger set of criteria, if you like, or ideas from Stephen Kellett and partners to uh, Terrapin distilling it to 14 patterns, a little simpler. Um, sometimes also people sort of just refer to nature in the space, nature of the space, and then these analogs um, as the three components. Uh, you'll see some real similarities. These are just sort of distilled down. Um, and I would say this is this is a good set of criteria if you're thinking about it more perhaps as a consultant. Personally, as a designer, I would say um, it's great to have a big list. But, you know, it's also fantastic that there are variations on a theme with any kind of approach because it allows different people with different thinking and working styles to grab hold of things that work for them. Um, so I'm just going to sum up some of the health benefits of biophilic design. Um, there has been a lot of academic studies and science that show um, the evidence for connection to air, uh, fresh air, for example, natural ventilation. Um, and there's been studies on people's health and the impacts of that quite extensively. There have also been quite a few around the access to natural light and um, what that does to improve uh, test scores with kids in classrooms, what that does to improve um, recovery rates in hospitals um, and the reliance on pain medication gets reduced uh, when people can just have access to a simple window. So there's quite a lot of scientific evidence um, and there have been, you know, very large companies that have picked up on that evidence. The concept of people being more productive um, has been picked up by big companies like Google, like uh, Salesforce, um, all of whom have biophilic design frameworks and spaces even in their, in their um, office spaces for their staff. Um, as well as sound, um, you know, we know that listening to nature sound, and if you're anything like me, you're, you're doing that perhaps regularly just to, to go to sleep or on an airplane, or, you know, it's become much more common now to listen to waves or wind or rivers um, as a way of meditating. So we know that nature has an ability to really calm our nervous system. Um, and we also know that it, it uh, improves our focus and our ability to restore our mind and our energy. Um, but often this is, you know, we're stuck in buildings that um, you, know, you can't even understand whether the, the rain's falling outside, there's it's windy or it's not, it's just a sterile sound uh, continuously, which really does affect our mental health. So just to summarize, um, before I hand over to Erin, biophilic design is essentially about this deep reconnection between us and uh, nature in the built environment specifically. Um, and, you know, it's also about sort of an education awareness. I really like to think about it as a reawakening um, that that we actually are part of nature and uh, not separate from it, which is kind of the what we have increasingly been told and what's sort of instituted in the spaces that we create for ourselves. Um, the buildings we create are typically about being dominant over nature, isolating people from the distraction of it um, or the inconvenience of, you know, working around it. Um, and biophilic design, I think, is an incredibly important movement within buildings to address that. Um, and uh, I do really think, as well as the reconnection component of biophilic design, it's also about emulating and mimicking nature to achieve that reconnection, especially when we look at the way that um, nature makes patterns, that nature, um, you know, creates all kinds of different light qualities, uh, or the way that nature you know, has various different spaces that give us an experience and a sense of uh, fulfillment from that experience. So there is a mimicry component to it, um, as well as the reconnection component to it as well. And essentially, I see them as very much an interconnected set of approaches um, and uh, overlapping continuously. So I think there's often been a sort of push of like, are you, are you doing, and especially for me, especially having done a lot of work in the biophilic design space to now being leading the Biomimicry Institute, 
all the time people say oh so are you not doing biophilic design now are you now doing biomimicry instead and I'm like there's no instead this is this is all connected um, and all part of the same approach and same way of thinking of reconnecting from nature, learning from nature systems. So I'll leave you with that and turn um, over to Erin to talk a little bit more about the biomimicry side. Great, and Erin, check your, uh, your mic before you come on. Can you hear me? Is that working? Okay. And you yep, can see sounds great. People? Okay. So um, that's just, so first of all, there's so much of what Amanda presented. I'm ready to dive into the conversation. I see the chat is going, so I'm looking forward to um, what we can discuss after. But if you have been in a position like both Amanda and I have, this is definitely a frequently asked question. If you've ever given a presentation on biomimicry or um, if anybody in the crowd is already familiar with biophilic design and have talked to others about that, um, hands get raised and say, what is the difference between biomimicry and biophilic design? I think it's come up at probably every single biomimicry presentation I've ever given. And it's really important um, to know the difference because there is a difference um, and they're both really powerful in their bounds. Um, biophilia is all about, I mean, my favorite sum up of biophilia is a quote from E.O. Wilson, who we love in biomimicry as well, which is, um, nature is the matrix in which the human mind was formed and developed and where our physiology sort of emerged from. And so we are inextricably linked um, with nature um, and all of our human processes are linked with nature. And so when nature is present, when nature is not present, when nature is thriving, when nature is not thriving has a direct effect on whether we are thriving or not. Um, so that's a very important framework to be understand as distinct from biomimicry, which is all about the functional emulation of nature's genius. But I think to Amanda's point of where she landed is it's also really, really interesting as designers to understand not only the differences, but how they can come together as tools. And as designers that we have these tools and these different frameworks that can work for us and that we can build fluency of how we can use these tools to produce really rich, really beautiful, really robust design outcomes that are, you know, in, um, in kind of compilation with each other, able to deal with the really complex design issues that come with these built environment challenges. So what I'd like to do today is share just some of the examples of how that can play out. And um, the projects that I'm sharing will come from a couple different sources. One is the Stephen Kellert Biophilic Design Award. This is an award that um, Living Future has been running um, since 20, 17 or 18, forgetting exactly which year. This is the 2021 award. Mm. It's an incredible building, as you can see, very, very unique. This is a project by Heatherwick Studios out of the UK. It's called Maggie's Leads. This is a um, sort of a, 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 I don't know what you would call it, like a respite center for cancer patients on a hospital compound. Um, kind of campus zone. And so the, the intention of this space was really to be very restorative, calming, um, and a place of relaxation for people who are really dealing with probably one of the most stressful experiences of their life. Um, and so um, this is, I think you can start to see that there's um, obviously a lot of planting going on. There's biomorphic forms 
Um, there are spaces I don't have, if you are interested in this project, you should look up the beautiful interiors that have a lot of this sort of concept of prospect and refuge, this play of light, this diffuse light patterns um, that make you feel like you're in a really multi-sensory type of environment that is reminiscent of um, the sort of multi-sensory experience that you would have in a natural environment. Um, where the biomimicry element starts to come in is that this is all native plantings um, that are really meant to start to look to how this native ecosystem of this place really functions. And if you listen to the architect's story of this, this has actually became a really critical connection point um, in terms of a ecological corridor um, for the larger urban environment there. Um, so this becomes a stopover point to help connect um, for birds and for pollinators um, to just kind of be one more bridge through the urban environment for an ecological corridor. Um, so this is just one example. And I think in terms of when we look at um, biomimicry, this has sort of this buttressing, which is a deep, deep pattern in, in nature that we can see over and over again as a structural solution. Um, the form is a, um, a really sort of common um, functional emulation in architecture that we can see, um, it's sort of the structures of architecture that we can say, how would nature optimize um, structure, particularly where we can um, dematerialize and lightweight things. Um, so there's lots of good examples in architecture of how that's happening. I think probably the most exciting um, biomimetic work happening right now in the built environment is um, the ecological performance standards work, um, where we're asking how can our built environment function more like the ecosystem next door. So that's really where we're starting to have um, more of these really uh, ecological impacts on place. And so I wanted to share more of those examples that are kind of speaking to that, that I feel like are really relevant right now. So this is um, one of those examples. This is another Kellert Award winner, actually the same year because we had just two great projects. We couldn't decide. This is the Louisiana Children's Museum um, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, this is a Methune project. And this project we really enjoyed because it has um, a lot of multi-sensory sort of experiential opportunities for the children. I don't know if you can see way over on the right hand side, there's sort of a fog um, misty thing happening over the bridge area. This is actually an artistic installation that you walk through this fog as you walk over the bridge. And it just creates this really magical moment um, of experiencing this sort of humidity, but the spatial change that happens as you walk through um, that mist. Um, and there's just a lot of opportunities for the children to engage in all the different materials and they're invited to actually touch things um, and just really be in contact with the nature around the site. The biomimicry element um, of this, is, at, which is also biophilic in its own right as well, is that um, obviously New Orleans has a history of some pretty traumatic flooding. Um, this site is designed in such a way that it um, alleviates some of the uh, utility infrastructure needs of the area and can actually sustain some of the flooding management um, should that, you know, storm events uh, take place. So this is actually designed to work with the watershed and work with um, the way that the the the, that whole ecosystem, which naturally floods, um, to design into that rather than try to resist, um, which is the biomimetic approach. So um, this one we thought was a really cool example of biophilia, but also shows how biophilia integrates with biomimicry. 
this one was a recent um, award winner and it's based in Japan. Um, this one is designed by um, Nikon Sei, a uh, group out of Japan. And this is the JR Kumamoto Railway Station Building. This was a really unique example because they had the design challenge of bringing nature into an extremely urban core, kind of like that image that Amanda showed of like, how on earth could you bring nature into such a concrete, dense environment? Um, and so that was the challenge that these, this design group wanted to take on. Um, and so they not only um, wanted to bring nature into this space, but they wanted to do it in a way that was biomimetic. So they studied the reference habitat in Japan, which was fascinating to read about as a um, jury member because I was totally um, unfamiliar with this reference habitat, um, which is all about the interplay of um, rocks as an abiotic factor and water and the plants. Um, and so they went as far as um, designing the plant distribution patterns to mimic how the plant distribution patterns in the reference habitat work and designed the light to enter the building in such a way that it would um, sort of be able to sustain that kind of plant distribution pattern. Um, they attuned the water sound to the sound of the water in the reference habitat so that as you're walking in this space, um, it actually sounds like the water um, in the reference habitat. Um, and it it is such a um, successful emulation of this space that, that the Japanese people really revere and know and love. Um, that the people in this area actually come and do forest bathing, which you might is a term you might be familiar with, where um, you know you go into the forest and sort of um, sort of cleanse and and um, reflect and and uh, get a bit restored um, by walking and through the forest, and so they'll actually do forest bathing in this environment, um, which is pretty incredible. So. I think at first blush, you might say, oh, this just looks like a lot of plants, but actually going deeper into the design design story, we see that there's a lot more to this um, and a lot more intentionality that went into this. Um, the Frick Environmental Center is another one that's a biophilic building. Um, and because it also, one of the things that we love about biophilic design is when it can bring people in contact with nature. It's got this huge overlap in biomimicry around the reconnect, um, which Amanda pointed out. Um, so biophilia is all about the human experience of nature. So when you see biophilic buildings, it's not always about plants. And this is a good example of that. Um, this is one where it became about the water. Um, and our human interaction and experience with water flows, which is a really important aspect of the, the whole Pittsburgh area um, has a lot of connection with water. And so the Frick Environmental Center has this really cool way of managing water where it comes off the roof into this water veil, they call it, and then um, is channeled down into this um, rock stream that's meant to emulate um, the way the rivers uh, work in that area. And so some of the green labels that you see here are some of those elements that Amanda was pointing out are the coming from that playbook of biophilic design elements that you can kind of pull in. Um, this is one that at Living Future we're all really excited about. Um, it's still uh, under development. It's the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library. Um, it's a Snowheda project. And this is in North Dakota. And I mean, you can see it's incredibly iconic and beautiful and impressive. Um, they've got a lot of biophilia going on here in terms of um, the natural materials, the natural patterns going on, and just the the deep immersion into nature that this um, 
this building will bring people into. But there's a there's a really interesting narrative behind it in terms of the connection to place. And this was um, by competition. And so this uh, particular design was chosen because of the way that it's actually one of the more subtle designs um, of all of the um, designs that were submitted. And that's because of how it is um, really came from a place of really trying to emulate the 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 habitat that's so visible there and just kind of disappear into it. Um, and that has to do with um, responding to the wind characteristics and the wind flows um, and the kind of plants that thrive there and and so forth. So again, just kind of like that functional, indistinguishable, just trying to blend in while also um, creating a thriving human habitat as well, trying to bring us in more well-adapted connection with nature and accomplish both at the same time. Um, this is um, just another, this is kind of an oldie but goodie. This is a Perkins and Will project, um, the Van Dusen Botanical Garden Visitor Center. If you're ever in this area, this is an easy one to get to and an easy one to experience. Um, obviously a lot of really beautiful sort of biomorphic forms and shapes. Um, this is another one that has leveraged water um, as well in terms of its tactile human nature connection experience. Um, but they also reference the, I don't know if you can see that sort of like atrium that's poking up on the ceiling there. Um, they reference uh, the a native white lily as being sort of their go-to design model. I mean, you can see that it took some structural engineering to accomplish this curvy roof. Um, and so when they sort of started to get stumped, you know, on how they were going to accomplish this, they would just kind of go back and say, how would nature do this? And so it's not always a, a direct emulation, but the team really adopted that mindset. And sometimes that's what biomimicry is about, is changing the design conversation and helping people just think differently about design solutions. Um, and asking how would nature do it is the, the perfect question to be asking. So I think that when we when we start to see like these are the proofs of concept, right, that it, this kind of integration can happen. They're not at odds. They're sister frameworks that are complementary. And there's a multi benefit approach that we can gain from this. Um, and so they're all listed here. Ecosystem benefit, you know, this human nature connection. Um, the climate action, you know. Um, and so I, I want to encourage all of us in the biomimicry community to think of these design frameworks, not as sort of a linear or like a umbrella that one contains the other, or that one is sort of stacking in terms of the other, um, in terms of its performance or potential. Because the fact is, is that just by bounding a framework, it's a, it's, leaving things out. So for example, by, there's nothing about biophilic design that will tell you about material toxicity. Um, we need something like the red list to tell us about how to make sure that we're specifying um, at that level of healthy materials. Um, just like biomimicry, it's not going to tell us about those human health factors and, and tap into some of that research. So I, I encourage us as designers to make these tools work for us. We can totally work towards gaining fluency between them. So if we think of it more like, you know, this process, like if we think of the analogy of a of a forest and we have this crown shyness, right? If you're a biomimicry nerd, you might have come across this function of crown shyness where it's a unified tree canopy, but they don't quite touch each other. There are these sort of edges that look like puzzle pieces coming together. And this is a photo, so it doesn't show it, but they even move together in this really pretty dance. And, and they just sort of are very elegantly staying together 
um, but also holding their boundaries. So, you know, if we have biomimicry as one part of this canopy where life is creating conditions conducive to life, this is where we go to discover nature's genius. And then we have biophilic design, which is like thinking about what is the human habitat? You know, we're a part of nature. You know, there's that quote from E.O. Wilson. And even what about placemaking? You know, this goes back to Jane Jacobs and her contemporaries saying, like, we shouldn't be designing cities around cars. You know, what is the urban environment? What is that supposed to look like? And all of these things sort of fit together, and they even go further than that. You know, there's parts of biomimicry that even look like conservation or restoration. And there's parts of placemaking or biophilic design that look like design thinking or human-centered design. Um, so all of these things can work together and we can say, is it biomimicry? Yes. Is it biophilic design? Yes. You don't have to say it's one or the other. We can say it's all of these things and it can be right. So I just, I know we're way over time and we want to have our conversation, but I just want to say that this is an approach that many of our greatest designers have taken. They've used nature as a model they connect with nature and it just feeds their everyday thinking. And I know that's what we're all here to do. And so we just need to stay close to nature, stay curious, look a little closer, see what else can come out of it. And just remember, you know, we're a part of nature and that can mean many, many things. That can mean designing for humans, designing for all of nature and kind of that we're doing the same thing all the time. So let's become a more well-adapted species and do the right thing with our design. Beautiful. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Amanda. That's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Lots, lots to chew on and think about here. I want to encourage everyone to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen here. You can submit your questions for, for uh, either or both of uh, our speakers here and for each other. Just engage if you see people on here that you want to talk to. Give them a shout out. Um, I know I've got my questions, but I want to defer first to you two and say what uh, from your you know long uh, shared work together, and then hearing each other present on this today with new contexts and new jobs that you're on, and and new things that have come up. What are your what are your thoughts? You know, synapsing between the two of you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think um, I think Erin and I are just in a, in a continuing conversation for probably a, a while yet to come um, as we're both exploring this. And I don't um, you know, I think it's one of those things where it's not necessarily one one answer. I think at any moment in time, you might I know when you ask me, I suspect the same of Erin. You know, this is this is adapting and changing as we start to refine our way to how we create our shelters and spaces back again to be reconnected with nature. And, um, you know, there's some beautiful projects that are out there as examples, but uh, there's also, you know, a lot being built still that's disconnecting people. And so, um, you know, I think there is, uh, yeah, there's just so much exploration still and figuring out how we bring tools resources to everybody to be able to move in this direction so i think i think it's a continual conversation that i hope to be having with erin for us you know as long as we're we're around on this planet <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. and i think you know um for everybody that i, I wonder how many people here are um working in built environment if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat because it'd be curious to know but i think uh, you know biomimicry a lot of times is uh, we talk about it in terms of product design or um other realms we also it but it's been really early adopted in built environment i think because um we aspire to that level of design um, so much in architecture. And, um, but I think this whole idea of ecological performance standards has been this vision 
that, you know, Janine has really been critical in helping articulate very early on as sort of this really clear vision. I mean, that was what really got me to go from being sort of a lead consultant and saying, okay, we're saving water, you know, we're getting, you know, more solar energy out there and and going, okay, this is really what we're going for. This is what real, we don't have to invent what sustainability looks like. Um, but so it's fascinating to me that there's still more to discover and there's still more to learn about all the things that we can do with architecture to, um, to make sure that we're designing with nature. And so this is like, if you're just learning about biomimicry or just learning about biophilic design, it's like, this is just a lifelong exploration and learning and it's a lot of fun. That's great. So we've got some questions starting to come in. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Deborah, who's got a question about kind of bringing this into community um, activity. Deborah, if you can unmute and pop on. Hi, hi yeah. everyone. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Erin. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Yeah, I've kind of gone down a rabbit hole in the last year and a half after becoming a uh, biomimicry educator. I work with the Transition Towns movement and I've become completely, which is uh, community-led climate resilience projects and we've got groups all over the world in 40 countries and I've become really excited about the potential of systems level biomimicry this whole kind of idea of redesigning our cities to be more like forests or you know sponge cities and all these different initiatives that I've been reading about May Britt Pedersen Zari's work and ecosystem services analysis and I just know that there's so many fantastic community groups that are trying to lead resilience and regeneration projects in their neighborhoods, towns, cities. And I guess my vision is, can we, how, how can, can we and how can we get the kind of biomimicry level or living systems design skills to community leaders so that instead of doing these small piecemeal permaculture projects, agroecology projects, rewilding projects, we get them thinking like, you know, systems designers and thinking, how can we actually regenerate a whole neighborhood or a whole town or a whole bioregion? And how do we work together to do that? And I would just love to facilitate that happening. And I wonder if you have any advice for us as a, as a nonprofit that, that would like to do that. <laughs> hey, Deborah, absolutely. I know we've had a little bit of, uh, you know, back and forth already a little bit on that. But um, yes, you know, before I joined the Institute, I was focused on large scale infrastructure, living infrastructure, living city work, nature positive cities. I'll pop in the chat later a report I did um, with in collaboration with many across government academia practice uh, called Nature Positive Sydney um, that uh, was really looking at essentially the systemic structures you need to put in play for that to happen from governance to education to capacity building to actual you know examples and standards and so I think I think to affect a whole city to affect even a very large infrastructure project or a town um, you have to look at the entire ecosystem of you know education awareness governance policies um you know, and the capacity building, essentially, I feel like with all of this, at whatever scale, we have a massive capacity challenge, you know, every engineer, architect, town planner has been learning and brought up on the opposite to what, <laughs> what we're talking about, which is how do you make it most efficient pipe, the, you know, the sort of the most concrete possible for convenience and maintenance, the, you know, least amount of trees that could be inconvenient. Um, you know, how do you essentially pave over entire town cities? Um, and I think we have an, a massive job to do to sort of all of us here to rebuild that capacity, that knowledge, that reconnection, that reawakening um, of that connection and the importance of it. So, yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts about it, which probably takes longer than answering your question here. But um, I do think it's a it's a key space. And uh, having jumped in to it for a couple of years as a consultant before I joined the institute, it was like, whoa, okay, this is um, this is a very complex challenge. But I do think we can figure it out. I hope we can continue the conversation. Or oh, yeah, you can side post me to someone that can help us as a. As an organization continue that exploration that'd be great yeah it makes me think a little bit in the kind of then even smaller 
uh, scale than that. How about people looking for ways to kind of bring this into their own current buildings, their homes, their offices? You know, you look at this and you think, well, if we had a you know million dollar renovation that we could do, maybe we can incorporate this. What are some things that people can do to kind of bring the benefits of biophilia into their existing, uh, you know, spaces? I think one of the things that's really fun is to kind of just do a biophilia audit. And, um, you know, that can be something very, very simple to something a little bit more robust. Um, I mean, you're kind of asking an open-ended question of like from your home to maybe like in your office. So maybe it could be, you know, we've done a fun activity in some of our biomimicry workshops of just like how, what could you do in your work from home office to make it more biophilic and just kind of take a look around and maybe it's repositioning your desk. Maybe it's, you know, what can you do? Um, so something as simple as that, you can have fun making your um, work from home office more um, biophilic. Um, and that that's just a way to get started. I think a lot of you know, with this is like, you have to set an intention, you have to know your why for what you want to do. I think that that's one thing that makes biophilia really powerful is that it, because it's connected to human health and wellness, um, that has a really powerful motivator for employers, um, where, you know, staffing is one of their highest um, costs. And so um, it can, it can have a, a a good influence on their willingness to adopt um, biophilia as a um, a way to approach, you know, revisiting interiors, or if they do have any sort of rem remodeling coming up, or they're looking for new office space. And then I think, you know, if again, like I see that kind of thing as just an inroad because. If you if that's a motivator, then there's natural overlap that where biomimicry, biophilia, these things can work together. Um, but yeah, the people centered approach kind of has a direct cost impact for employers. That seems to be motivating. Yeah, yeah, and I would just say I think it's key to firstly understand your place. I mean, the brilliant sort of genius of place work that Byron Crew three point eight has done. Um, you know, to really understand deeply your place, I think is the first place to start to understand the indigenous culture, understand the ecology, understand the biome that you're within. And um, I think you go from there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll go a very different direction here. We've got a great question from Carlos. So Carlos, if you're ready, you can come on, we'll bring you on screen. Um. Thank you. Yes, uh, I had a question regarding um, nowadays we see a lot of trends of using data and LMLs and behavioral research and human based on human innovation. I was I was thinking as well, how can we uh, adapt AI enhancements based on codes and patterns and parametric design to see how we could create uh, a better uh, biomimicry, biomimetic and biophilic design? Thank you. Is do I understand the question is how we can use AI to create um, parametric structures and codes that can sort of create generative structures and okay. Um, there's start. a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of work that's being done um, in that space. I haven't kept up with what's going on in the potential of how AI can start to influence what's happening there. Um, I know that AI is going to have a huge impact on the accessibility to um, biological research that becomes relevant to our design challenges. I think that that might be the biggest area where it's going to accelerate our ability to do the research part, which tends to be um, the most challenging part is when we go from figuring out what our design question is and then finding the relevant biological mechanism. Um, and then the coding part is a little bit, that's that's for really smart people like you, Carlos, I think that are working in those spaces. But that's where I see AI kind of in an exciting space in biomimicry is just accelerating the research process. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I think particularly with skeletal structures, I know that's something that Janine's talked about a lot. There's a huge amount of sort of research potential for skeletal structures to reduce the amount of material in, in building structures, anything from bridges to, you know, um, to buildings. And I think to be able to think that we could actually sort of map that in AI as a, as a sort of design structural tool um, to be able to sort of seamlessly come in through the design process, I think is very exciting um, because I think, yeah, it could, it could result in a, in a massive sort of reduction of material needed and efficiencies of, of resources. Um, the thing I'm beginning to wonder though, is like how much fossil fuel are we going to use for the AI data centers to, make our things more efficient on the other side is that going to be a trade-off but um but yeah that's probably another another topic <laughs> yeah um there's a an example from the ray of hope accelerator too strong by form is a group that uses wood for all of the benefits that wood is is useful for but can be adapted to other forms right so they basically it's basically like a uh, you know a particle board where you're, they're breaking everything in the wood down to small chips, right? And then assembling it in organic forms. And they're using computer modeling to get really organic nature inspired uh, shapes that they're able to then basically fabricate out of wood. So it's a lot more sustainable than say concrete, which would normally be used for, for a lot of shapes like that. Um, and once, once you're bringing that level of kind of digitized form building, into it, then that opens it right up to AI, where it can you can be, um, you know, filling spaces based on these extrapolated models of the the kinds of curvatures and things that are present in nature and and the the way seams are made. There's also then the structure that is used within nature to support these shapes. So like uh, there's a great example of you know a, a giant lily pad floats on the water surface and a hot frog can hop on it. And you just think, well, that's, that's what it is, right? It's, it's a leaf, it's on top there, but there's a really specific structure of ribbing kind of in two directions that allows that gives it that really structural integrity. And so that can be a part of it too, is looking to um, the, the methods that uh, organisms have taken to support these structures and drawing from those principles and then digitizing from there, or, you know, like incorporating that into kind of an intelligence in there where that could be applied in all kinds of uh, levels. Thanks. That, yeah, that's an interesting one. Okay. Oh, and uh, Carlos, it appears you also have a follow-up question that uh, you have been cleared. So go ahead. <laughs> yes, the Sorry for that. Este, yeah, I, I was I wanted most of the times I know that we have um the least certification on buildings. Uh, but I wanted to ask if there's a specific rubric. I think that Amanda mentioned it a little bit regarding of how you ponder um environmental sorry, sorry, social and environmental responsibility, energy usage, sustainability, circular economies, and um uh, as well human development or impact on on different um uh, uh, communities as well. And also a little bit of uh, design for this assembly, life cycle, uh, human center design, and basically ethical behaviors, a little bit of everything. But how do you uh, reconcile all of these measurements in order to have um, a, a scorecard that unifies all of those uh, impacts? Thank you. Well, I would say that it's not a scorecard, probably solution or methodology. I think um, this has to be more about how um, we deeply relearn and reconnect with our ecologies and our places. Um, and uh, I think nature has the measurements <laughs> um, in terms of ecosystem sort of service or performance. Um, versus us trying to create a sort of people centric, you know, list or categorization of lists. Um, because I also think it's different depending on where you are, even if you're in one biome. Um, and I, I do think that the biggest sort of scorecard, if you like, is nature itself in the place in which you're, in which you're building. And I'll just add on that, uh, that we're at the top of the hour. Um because I just want to, my my big message that I wanna just share with everybody is that, especially if you have a design background and you're doing design work, just remember that the superpower of designers and our core competency is we're master synthesizers. And so 
that is the work that we need to continue to apply. Um, so just by bringing all of these frameworks in um, and sort of learning them and understanding them so that you can synthesize them and apply them creatively in a way that these checklists are supplementing but not driving, um, I think is the way to really um, produce the best design um, possible. And especially one where we don't fully understand all of the mysteries of the way that nature works, that we really need to um, go with intuition in some level where science hasn't caught up to the way that we more intuitively know the way that nature works um, in some instances. So um, there's not a checklist for everything that we, we aspire to achieve as well. So it's a little bit of both. So just lean into your design superpowers. Very well said. Uh, Amanda, do you have some uh, closing thoughts here as we reach the top of the hour? Oh, just that it's, you know, it's such an exciting space for me to be exploring more. I think our buildings have such a long way to go in terms of reconnecting and we spend so much time in them. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, we're looking forward at the Institute to doing more around the building space and really sort of digging in more deeply around uh, this built environment sort of question and patterns of learning um, and how we bring more biomimicry and biophilia uh, into the built world, scaling to infrastructure and cities as well. So, um, yeah, an exciting space that we're looking forward to doing more in in the future. That's great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, here today. Thanks for everyone that's that's been here, Erin and Amanda. Thank you for presenting us with all of this and synthesizing so many years and projects worth of thought and effort. Uh, really beautiful package and and a lot to think about. So. Um, this as as you do have a lot to think about think of you know your key takeaways from this the questions that still linger the things that you're never going to forget and we'll continue that conversation on the ask nature hive um so those of you who are already members just keep uh going right on in we'll be posting questions and and follow up and takeaways there we have some guests who are not yet members of the hive so please we invite you to join us we'll send you an email after this um, with more information on how you can do that and we'll look forward to continuing this conversation and preparing for the next one. So join us in December, where we'll be speaking with Dr. Barbara Natterson Horowitz on human health insights from other animals. So you may be familiar with this if you've seen it on Ask Nature. We've presented her work before in the Sisterhood of Species collection that we have, where um, as a uh, heart surgeon, she was called to uh, help out with a lion that was having heart issues. And she through that experience at this zoo, realized the amount of information that there is to be learned about how human bodies work by looking at the bodies of our really very close relatives, right? There's there's all of our distant relatives, but there is hardly a difference between us and you know another mammal, right? So, so much to learn and it's a really exciting uh, place um, uh, place that she takes you, you know, cognitively and, and emotionally as you think through these connections. It's really great for reconnection. We're really excited to have her joining us in December. So join us on The Hive, continue this conversation, get ready for that one, and continue to explore your ideas, engage with all of this wonderful community. People really, as you saw from the chat around the world, from a lot of different disciplines, we're really all happy to be sharing this space to share this work. Um, thanks again, everyone, for being here, and we'll see you again soon, and we'll see you in the Ask Nature Hive.